Okay, so welcome everybody um, to our uh, session about uh, wild, uh, gardening with, with wild, um, gardening for wildlife. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Helena. Uh, and uh, my name is Kashka, um, and I work for uh, Tayport Community Garden, which is run by Plants, uh, um, which is part of Tayport Community Trust, and we fund it through uh, Climate Challenge Fund, which is a Scottish government funding. And um, today, uh, um, I would like to welcome you to one of our online um, uh, gardening workshops, which is a little collaboration between a number of partners, including Plant, uh, Strathkinnis Community Garden, uh, Yellow Wellies Gardening, and uh, Nine Wells Community Garden. And today, uh, we have Helena presenting from, um, who is a representative of Nine Wells Community Garden, and she's gonna present today's workshop. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Helena, um, to take it away. And we're going to come back after about 20 minutes uh, for Q&A, but make sure if you have any questions that pop into your head, pop them into the chat uh, uh, while she's speaking, while Helena is speaking. Okay, Helena, over okay. to you. Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, we're going to talk about gardening for wildlife. And so this is a, a way of trying to think about all the different things that we can do to just support the wildlife in our garden and maybe bring some more wildlife into our garden if we're not seeing a lot there already. Um, so what, in order to um, encourage the wildlife into our garden, which could be insects, it could be butter, well, butterflies are insects, it could be birds, it could be mammals, small mammals, um, all sorts of different things, but they all actually need each other because it's all part of an ecosystem. Um, so we need to think about what, all, if you're looking to encourage something specific, you need to think about what that specific thing needs. And it might be that you want more butterflies. And if you want more butterflies, you have to supply enough for its entire life cycle. So it needs to have a habitat. Everything needs habitat, somewhere to live, food and water. So if you can provide all these things in the garden, that, then that will give you a, a better chance of getting more wildlife in your garden. So from the very bottom layer of the um, food chain is actually feeding the soil. So if you make sure that there's plenty of um, organic matter in the soil, you'll get lots more invertebrates in the soil and that will provide food for, for example, your, your birds, um, small, small mammals, um, if you've got the right plants for specific uh, animals that will help as well so um, there's all kinds of different habitats where the different insects live as well I'm trying not to do too much talky talking <laughs> but um, you've got different habitats and different animals and different insects will live in different habitats long grass short grass and something that's evergreen is meant to be really good for encouraging the wildlife in your garden because there is a, then, then a place that the wildlife can remain, um, whether it's um, over winter or somewhere to hide, and um, having different levels of things as well, like trees and shrubs, and um, some cover for the insects or the birds or the mammals to hide in is also really important. I'm going to just show you a little bit of. Um, going to attempt the screen share and show you some of the wildlife that I'm seeing in my garden at the moment. Um, and this is, I think they all heard that I was going to do a wildlife talk because they seem to all come visit me this week. Now, <laughs> I don't know if you can all see that, but that's the frog that lives in my pond. There's little eyes peeking out there. This past couple of weeks we found this little mouse in the garden it was quite feeling quite brave and let us watch it for a while and then it was very very kind because it climbed up and started eating weed seeds so it was being a very helpful garden uh, friend this was just beautiful this was just something that i saw in the garden a moth um, and again butterflies are always useful and nice to see the other <laughs> the other day I ended up with, in fact, two hedgehogs in my garden. I've been in this house for 13 years, never seen a hedgehog. We knew there was a hedgehog there because we started hearing it huffing. It was huffing and we realised it was actually two and we don't know if they were having a bit of an argy-bargy with each other because they seem to spend a lot of time just sort of sizing each other up and not looking. Um, 
this one's this was an action shot you can see there's a bee <laughs> and and the butterfly there and then we've got another different kind of a bee which i don't actually know what kind this is but this was as a result of providing some habitat that the bee could could use talking of habitat this is a very um you don't have to go all out and make a, a giant bug hotel or you can that's okay too but um it's already interesting i don't know if you can you see my mouse moving can you see down here there's a pile of sawdust where something's already been um i can see it it's... can you see it thank you there's there's a pile of sawdust here where something's already been eating into the the, the old wood that we'd collected over time and so you can tell that it's actually in use and things are, are happening but equally a pile of sticks just like this straight on the ground would be a great habitat to have just leaving the garden a little bit untidy is actually a, one of the best things that you can do for wildlife because nature isn't naturally tidy it likes to have um places to hide places to forage places to um just get away from us humans, I guess. So if you can make a small area and just leave it and let, let the long grass grow or let nettles grow, then that can actually make a really great habitat and that will introduce a lot more things in, in your garden. All right, I'm gonna start showing you things because I feel like I've been talking and not necessarily showing you stuff. So we've talked about habitat, we can also talk about food different um different an insect animals need different things to eat so we saw the mouse eating the seeds seed pods there um a lot of moths need long grass for if you can see the different kinds of grasses i've found here can you see that yeah that looks good yeah so you can see that having a little bit of long grass that's three that's all three different kinds at least, and they'll all be doing different things for different insects. So that's a useful sort of thing, not to not mind. You suddenly have to not mind too much. And if you start not cutting your grass as often, you'll get, this is white against thing, oh, it's white. You'll start it's getting, lav uh, not lavender, try again, clover in your lawn. And also, Daisy flowers. So daisies, did you know the Latin name for daisy is Bellis perennis, which means always beautiful. And I think they are, and they're actually, the, the Plant Life charity did a wee um, experiment to find out what gave the maximum number of flowers in your lawn, that, whether that's the clovers or um, daisies. And they found that a mowing every four weeks was actually gave you the maximum number of flowers because things like um, the ones I just shown you, this this clover and the daisies, they you take the heads off and they just regrow new heads. You don't actually get rid of the plant. So that's having a bit of um, clover in your lawn and a bit of daisies and some dandelions is actually really beneficial because it provides a nectar source. Dandelions provide a really early nectar source and one of the first ones for bumblebees when they're out foraging. But if you want to get more active and grow things that will really benefit insects, I think there's a few, let's see, I've got, there's a few things in your vegetable garden which are fantastic. This is borage. Um, I don't know if you can see that okay, but this borage is a brilliant bee attractor. And what it does, the reason it's so good is it actually replenishes its nectar every two minutes. So the bees can keep on coming back and getting more and more nectar. And then when your courgettes are flowering, they know to be coming to your garden and they'll come and they'll pollinate your courgettes as well. And they'll make sure you'll get your courgettes and all your other plants um, poll and your beans all pollinated by making sure that you've got your, your insect um, Food buffet ready. So that's one kind. That's really good for the bees. Just gonna put this down. 
but different insects require different things. We saw the picture of the butterfly on the oregano. Um, if you pull it back a little bit. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, okay. So this oregano is actually really good for a number of different insects. It's got a nice wide base so that butterflies can land on it, but the bees can also come in and get lots of um, nectar as well. Last year when it, we had all those painted lady butterflies, they were all over my patch of oregano and also um, the lavender. They were, it was absolutely amazing. You would walk by and there'd be clouds of butterflies just flying up, which was really, really lovely to see. So we need to think about trying to pr provide different shapes of flowers, different kinds of flowers. So this one here isn't really that useful for large insects because it's quite wobbly. This is one of the brassica family. So That's any of the brassicas are actually really popular with hoverflies. And hoverflies are great because then you've got your aphid, uh, aphid eaters um, being laid nearby because uh, hoverfly larvae are, um, love aphids. So not only are you introducing more wildlife to your garden, you're actually getting the benefits from having these ones if you're wanting to, um, wanting to reduce your aphid population. I don't know anyone that's trying to increase the aphid population. Same with butterfly, uh, ladybirds as well, obviously, they're, they're aphid eaters. So you want to make sure that you've got lots of good, good source of, of food. Now this is another type of a flower. This one's actually coriander that I've just let go to seed. I always let it go to seed, partly because it self seeds, but also because it's a really nice flower for insects to land on and to um, get some nectar from. So that's another good one. All these umbles, I've got to get my um, skirts in. Anyone that's seen one of these um, talks before has probably heard about skirts. So skirts are actually a root vegetable, but this one here is now it's flowering um, and it's, it's always absolutely buzzing with insects as well. All of these flowers which have umbels, it's the carrot family. These are really good. They've got good landing pads for butterflies. They've got, you know, lots of different small flowers so that you can provide lots of different bits of food um, for various insects. And of course the insects will supply the food chain further up so you've got the birds that can then eat the insects, um, which is really good. One way to just encourage more insects is actually just when you're walking around, have a look and see what insects seem to like different flowers. So I've got this geranium here, and I've got to say, I've really come to appreciate geraniums this year. The bees have really been all over it. I've got a couple of different varieties and that gives us a longer flowering um, time. Because what you're wanting to do is feed the insects all the way through. So they've got the greenery when they need greenery, but they also, different insects need the nectar. Another popular one, and again, this one we've got to, I have to do just because it's got a funny name. This is Silibum maritimum, uh, which I don't <laughs> ever mispronounce. <laughs> and, um, and there's a thistle. And any thistly type flowers seem to just be complete insect, nectar insect attractants. And I would really recommend, if you can get one with a silly name, all the better. Um, but there's lots of ones, including all the knapweeds. They're all really, really popular. Um, the centuria, I showed in a, another talk earlier, but that one's mostly gone over now. So it's nice to have more than one type. So again, you're just extending this, this season of um, availability of, of flowers. Again, if you're looking to um, encourage bees to pollinate your flowers, your flowers, your fruit and veg, um, getting some nasturtium in is really good. It's also loved by the white, cabbage white butterflies. And that would hopefully keep them away from your um, prize kale. So if we can get them, get them to eat a sacrifice plant instead, not only are you keeping the wildlife in your garden, you're actually helping your own crop, which has got to be a plus in my book. 
if you leave your kale uncovered, you might see this kind of thing. Can you see the holes in the leaves? Yep. Yep. No, yep. this was very obvious. Yep. There's actually little tiny caterpillars growing on there, eating on there, enjoying life. You probably won't be able to see that. That's a bit too close. No, but, you can't see the yep. caterpillars, sorry. But anyway, you can see what they've done. So um, we know that they are happily chomping away at this. This is actually some of my perennial kale. The advantage of the perennial kale is I can leave it uncovered. I cannot mind it getting chomped to pieces. I can enjoy the butterflies and it will come back from roots um, in the winter when the butterflies aren't around and it will still continue to grow. So one thing I would, I would say is not to mind if you are seeing some holes in your, in your leaves because you've got, if we want to have, if we want to have the wildlife, which I think we do, um, you need to accept that it's not just our garden. The garden's for everyone. And um, if, you can, if you can not mind <laughs> a little loss here and there, especially if you have some sacrifice plants that are, um, you're expecting to lose to the insects, then you can still have all the benefits and also help, help all the um, insects that are around. There's been, a, I think it's a 75% decrease in flying insects over the past 25 years which is absolutely phenomenal. So any help that we can give them, I think is really, really good. I was just also wanting to maybe see if you might be interested in thinking about what has been commonly thought of as a weed as being maybe a little bit more beautiful. This is what I call tiger and cubs. And again, it's got that nice sort of landing pad for the, for the insects to land on. Can you see that okay? I think it's a really nice one. It can be a little bit invasive, but if you just take the seed heads off once they've started to form, then you should be able to stay in control of it. Right, and also this is another one. You know that little purple, purple one that grows in your lawn called self-heal? If you let it grow in a border, it's actually quite lovely. And you could quite happily have that in, in a flower border, and then you would be, again, benefiting the insects. I think it's just a lot of it's a question of how we're looking at plants, whether we choose to believe that they are problematic or not. I mean, a lot of the flowering plants we have in the garden have been bred from um, from what we would might refer to as weeds. So yarrow, for example, that's one that you can. It, no, it comes. You get the. Oh, oh, I can never say it. Oh, Camilla. Um, coming in different, all different colours, you get the pinks and things, but on, even the white form is, is quite lovely. And again, it makes a nice, um, nice bit of food. I'm just going to show you some other ones that, again, I think these are kind of a cross between weeds and not weeds. I think of them as not weeds, but somebody thinks, some people seem to like them. This is um, purple toad flax. And again, you'll see that absolutely humming with insects and it's quite beautiful, but it mostly doesn't get planted as a intentional plant. Okay, so one last little thing before I move on to water, about food. So hopefully you'll all recognize this, ivy. It's one of the most useful gardening for wildlife plants that you can um, grow somewhere around your garden. It provides shelter, it provides the late berries um, and late flowers um, and so it's really beneficial if you can leave some old growth ivy and not cut it back uh, when the birds are likely to be nesting. They'll often make nests in, in the ivy because they can hide in it. And obviously things like nettles are absolutely essential if you like the butterflies because it's the food source for the, nest, for the caterpillars. One thing you can do, which will be guaranteed to increase your, the wildlife in your garden is put in a pond. And I know not, not everyone could put in a pond, but putting in a water source is absolutely um, just one of the best things you can do. If you don't have space for a pond, I'm gonna show you a little bit, a uh, quick thing, just checking the time. Um, now this here is, 
a broken bowl that I happen to have. So instead of just chucking it straight in the bin, I decided I was going to repurpose it. I'm just going to put this down because it'll be easier. I'm not going to use this yet. So all you need to do to make a nice drinking bowl from um, for bees or anything else, hedgehogs, for example, just a couple of stones inside so that when you fill it with water, the stones are still sticking out the surface of the water so that if any bees accidentally land in the water, they can still climb out and fly away so they won't drown. So just something like that, as simple as that, make sure it's topped up with water and that will provide a drinking bowl for bees or for hedgehogs or if a frog happens to be going by your garden, it could pop in and just rehydrate nicely there. So something as simple as that can really benefit um, all sorts of wildlife. Okay, we're gonna move on to the, the stone, the mystery stone. Okay, so the reason, I almost want to open it up as a quiz to see if anyone knows why I've, I've got a stone. <laughs> um, does anyone want to have a guess in the, in the chat box what, what yes. this one is for? Let's do that, yeah. yeah. If you type in what do you think that might be, we well, don't have a have prize. Like but... It's a stone. The fact is it's a stone is the, the, the real... Keep going. Thing. We need it more, does, more it answers. It look like this. And it's to benefit wildlife. And it will actually also benefit your gardening at the same time. <laughs> okay, I, I think everybody's so really since, um I really want someone to There's come only with one that answered at the two, moment. We've got two answers. Oh, no, the same person twice. But geez, it's not pumice, it's, it's a hard stone. And not in budgies? Is that for them to eat something? I don't know. Is it, it's not, it's, it's stone rather than um, anything off the beach and uh, cuttlefish or anything like that. I think you've stumped your audience, Helen. How, How nice. about you save them I'm from the misery? Oh uh, no! I so, well, I might maybe like hedgehog Hed mineral lick. I like it. I like the idea too. Yeah, they might be able to get something off that. It's actually <laughs> making sure that you've got a stone. This was this is my prompt for the thrushes to knock the snail shells on, because if you don't have anything for them to break the snail shells they won't actually break the snail shell, be able to break the snail shells, eat the snails in your garden, and therefore benefit you and your small plants that you want to do. So having even just like a little stone somewhere around, especially near your vegetable patch, is really useful. And then hopefully you can bring the thrushes in and then they will use your, their stone as a, a knocking board to, to get into the, um, into the snail shells. So that was, that was <laughs> my trick question. <laughs> um, Thrush Anvil says somebody, yes. Yeah. So the other thing you can do is start a compost heap. An open compost heap is actually a really good place to provide lots of food for birds that are foraging. When we put out our homemade compost this year, it was the thrushes thought that they were having the best time ever. We realised that we should probably wait a week after um, putting the compost down because we kept planting things and the thrushes kept trying to get underneath to all the lovely worms that were still in the compost and trying to all the bugs. So we did have to kind of, um, we ended up having to net it a little bit just, to, just until the plants established and so they could come. So obviously that was a real like delicious feast for them and, uh, and that's something that you know, it's obviously a benefit to all the insects, all the all the food chain, all the way up. Um, another wee thing about if you can have a pond, uh, just jumping back, I just remembered, if you can get it at deeper than sixty centimeters, it won't, it shouldn't freeze over winter, so things can hibernate over winter in it. But if you, if that's, if this is all you can do, this is better than nothing. Right, I am going to more or less stop there and ask, I think Bob was going to show us a few extra wild flowers from a meadow. Is Bob around? Bob, um, are you okay to unmute yourself? We've got about uh, five minutes for you to share your meadow flowers and a little bit yeah, of information as a teaser. Oh, your camera's not on still. 
Right. Um, so we're hoping that we'll do a yeah. meadow making yeah. session uh, maybe next month sometime or later in the year. Um, okay. How are you getting on there, Bob? Um, I think the camera's still not working. Bob, um, how about we take some questions while you work out yeah. your camera and then we can slot you in later on. If that's okay. It was working before, but technology as usual. Um, right. Um, I'm going to start on questions. Um, and, oh, mice in the garden. Uh huh. We have spotted quite a few this year, and I don't mind them at all, but I'm concerned in case they become a nuisance in some way, or are they beneficial and to be encouraged? Well, I think when I saw them eating the, I uh, had some uh, seed, the weed seeds of the hairy tear, and that was the one, the picture that I showed you earlier, that, and they were actually eating the seeds of that. We've had them in our garden for several years, and. I've never seen one in the house. So I think if there's enough for them to eat outside, they're probably gonna stay outside because that's their preferred location. Um, okay. I don't know if anyone else has had any experience with mice. Now, uh, next one is again uh, about wildlife potentially becoming a nuisance. How would you deal with wasp nests near to the house? Uh, and right. maybe general comment on wasps is... Yeah, wasps are actually quite beneficial because they tend to eat um, caterpillars. So you will, you've got to weigh up the pros and cons. If they're somewhere where you can just leave them be and they're not going to be bothering you, I wouldn't be worrying about them. But if they are causing a nuisance, I would try and stop them starting the nest in the first place. If you're out in the garden quite a lot, just, you know, if you're seeing a lot of activity and they've just started making a nest, I would maybe just take that off until it kind of discourages them. Um, it's not something I can really speak to because it's not been an issue. Uh, we did once have an, a nest in our shed and they actually took it all away at the end. It was all got, we went to take it away in the winter and, and the whole nest had gone. So I don't know quite what happened there, but um, if you don't mind waiting, it does seem to resolve itself. Okay, so the next one was uh, really a question what brassicas were and Rod uh, oh. Crawford really nicely answered. Thank you. Uh, that question in the chat already. So it's cabbages, kale, cauliflower, turnips, etc. So it's a group oh, of oh, vegetables, sure. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Is yeah. that oh. you going to add anything to that? Um, no, but if you do let any of them flower, you, if you if something bolts and you have the space to leave it, I would absolutely let it go because um, the flowers are quite incredible. A broccoli flowers turn like a, bro a head of broccoli turns into flowers like taller than. Than I, you can see on my screen and there are flowers all the way up so you know it's sometimes it's worth letting things go to the seed just to see how it looks and just to see what kind of benefits it can give you um, in the garden right I think Bob is back with his phone Bob um, hopefully yeah <laughs> yes I can hear you that's great um, okay good so did you want to um, just give a brief show show and tell yeah. of your window middle flowers yeah, okay, I'll do that. Um, hi there. Um, we've got a couple of... Um, so, uh, just before you go ahead, I should probably introduce you. Um, so yeah. Bob is uh, associated with uh, Strathkinis Community Garden and who's, um, in this one of the partners who have been uh, uh, delivering these workshops with us. So Bob, go ahead. Yeah, um, in Strathkinis, we've got a couple of um, wildflower areas. We've got a up in the play park, um, We've got a corn, some cornfield annual flowers. And um, these are really good for wildlife because they're simple flowers, sim simple single flowers, 
and so uh, you get a lot of uh, pollinators attracted to them. Um, I can just maybe show these here. You can see mm -hmm. the, the poppy, the red poppy, the blue corn flower, and there's uh, the yellow corn marigold. Um, the, the other one you can get is a corn cockle, which is a nice purpley uh, pink flower. Uh, these used to be in, in farmers' fields years ago, but there's no, none of those left now, so we can sell our own. The time to do this would be in, um, in the spring. You prepare your ground um, and um, sow the seed. We, we got our seed from Scotia Seeds, in, which is a Scottish company, and they actually raise all their plants in Angus and Fife. A uh, really good company to deal with, and they give you a lot of uh, recommendations as well. Um, normally, you have to do the cornfield annuals every year, but uh, we haven't actually sown any in the last three years. We just um, till the ground up and, and the seeds come up again. Um, then, really briefly, there's the wildflower um, meadows with the perennial flowers. And um, now a lot of people are leaving their grasses to grow longer now, so you can do that and you can get all sorts of um, lovely grasses and wildflowers coming up. But if you, if you want to add a few of your own, then, um, then you can do so. You can get the seeds from places like Scotia and um, it's just a, just a selection of the ones we've got here. And what we've got, we've got field scabious. I'll just show you that one. Field scabious. Um, we've got gnat weed that Helena showed earlier. And um, we've got um, this one here, which is an echium called Vi Viper's Buglas, which is a great one. Um, this one here, Fox and Cubs, lovely name, and uh, a nice little one. Um, Ragged Robin. There's, there's quite a few different ones. Um, just so, to Bob, say, yeah, um, I think we're sort of running short on time. Okay, uh, I'll just to say to you, you really need to um, prepare your ground like you would for growing vegetables and sow your seeds. You can either do it in your, you could do it actually in August or, or wait until the spring and so, um, um, then you'll get your meadow. Should we okay? maybe, um, we'll probably run a, a workshop on how to do this with blow by blow account on how to maintain yeah. it as well but that's a really yeah. lovely introduction to all the just the colors yeah. and it's stunning right okay. so okay. um let's go back to the questions thanks bob yeah that's cheers. lovely stuff uh so i had a question my i think the next question was mine it was to do with uh moths so you said uh, a lot of um moths need grasses yes why so, um, so why why would they need grasses? Well, I guess their um, caterpillar stages would be eating them. So, and they also use them to hide. And you often see if you walk through a meadowy area, you will see the the fluttery moths, the paper moths, all coming through. And and I think that that's that's one of the things that they because not everything needs flowers. A lot of things eat vegetation and. A lot of in, insects have a very specific um, association with a specific plant because they man they, you know like they need that specific plant to to grow to eat. Um, so the more diversity you can have of of habitats as well as different plants, the more chance you are to have different wildlife coming in to your garden. Great, thank that you. Explain. Um, yeah. Chris, did you want to ask your question yourself or need to unmute yourself? You had a um, question about geraniums. Okay, I'm just going to uh, ask it then. Um, which particular geranium varieties do you have, um, Helena, in your garden? <laughs> I have ones that my friends have in their gardens. <laughs> ones that they give me cuttings of. So um, I have 
the pink ones and the purple ones. <laughs> so I basically just have been lucky enough to have been given cuttings from, from various places. And because they're different varieties, they do have slightly different flowering times. So um, that's the best. I, I love sharing plants. And um, like I say, if you, if you go to a friend's garden and you notice something is humming with bees or really popular, ask for a cutting. You might be able to get a plant out of it. <laughs> Right, um, I think we're running quite uh, close um, to the time. So I'm just going to read out people's questions just now. And if you have a follow up question, just pop, um, you know, just uh, turn your mic on and, and ask it. So Mark has got a question about um, caterpillars. Uh, do they actually eat Swiss chard as well as the kale? I don't know for sure. I wouldn't, don't see why not. Um, Probably different species. Yeah, I, I don't think cabbage white goes for chard. No, because it's not a uh, brassica. Though. Brassica. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got to say, I'm not sure about that, but a lot of things will try and eat your vegetables. Um, yeah. So the more sometimes they're only active at night, so it might not be obvious what's uh, what's eating them. But maybe slugs. I think chard slugs. Yeah, I think they yes, might, the young leaves, I think mm, they do. Mm. Well, well, if you Jill, can get more predators in, that would help maintain um, the, the population to a lower extent. So your frogs and your hedgehogs and mm. your birds. They also, there's a permaculture idea, which is that you're never looking to actually get rid of all the pests, because that way you can keep a level of predators around as well. So that if the pests increase, the predators can increase to keep on top of it so you're just looking for a, like a low level of, of pests and with enough predators just to keep them at that low level so if they do boom then the predators will also boom and then you'll bring it back down again. So Jill's got two questions in one. Mm -hmm. um, she says that her, her coriander has shot up like yours um, mm -hmm. and flowered and uh, she cut it back and didn't think it was usable uh, anymore and she's thinking of leaving it for wildlife now is that a yeah, sensible well, idea? I, you can eat the, the, the leaves, the flowers are edible, you can eat the flowers um, or use them to decorate salads or whatever but um, yeah I would tend to, if you need, if, unless you need the space to plant something else I would tend to leave it because the other advantage is that you will get seeds and it will self seed and then you never need to buy coriander seeds again. Um, so. <laughs> She also has a, <laughs> she has a question about ivy. She's got a um, hedge running around the whole garden and it's lovely, but it's uh, taking over and coming up through to house and climbing up the walls. Okay. Um, other than hacking it back at source all the time, is there any advice for killing ivy off as we've not found anything to comes to as yet? I don't know about killing ivy, sorry. Um, I think if you want to keep it under control, maybe keeping it, you can cut it back, but just be aware that it is, if you can leave some for flowering um, and for berries, it's a really useful food source um, for first bees and then birds over winter. Um, I guess you could try and maintain it as smaller than it is. And if it's smaller, then it wouldn't be so much to look after. Uh, there's somebody that, um, uh, Chris, I think, said that uh, apparently it only gets snails if you've got enough lime and um, they only get slugs at their place. You, they need calcium to build the snail shells. So I guess if they've not got enough calcium, the snail shells won't be strong enough to actually protect them. But um, then that's when you need to be attracting your hedgehog, I guess, to get your slugs under control. <laughs> I've actually seen blackbirds eating slugs as well. So blackbirds will eat slugs. They seems to be quite sticky, but they, they keep going and keep eating them. So if you can get your blackbirds in with, um, you know, having the right habitat for the blackbirds to hide in, you know, the bushes for them to hide in and feel safe, um, then maybe that would be a way of keeping on top of some slugs. Uh, Rod had a lovely comment about parsnips going to seed and flower, that they're very beautiful and also attractive to wildlife, so they can um, yeah. stay there for at least two years. 
That's um, I think that they flower in the second year. So if you overwinter them and they start to grow again in the mm. spring, then that's when they'll put up the flower shoot. Um, and it tends to go very woody and you can't really eat it. But um, at the same time, yes, you can enjoy the flowers. Right, Heather uh, has got a question. She's, she's got a pretty tricky space, fifth floor flat with a small balcony. And a few things have been flowering, courgette, kale, mustard, thyme, coriander. Mm. Uh, but they haven't seen any bees yet. Um, mm. Heather, so it's quite sunny. Yeah. Heather, did have they no... formed into proper courgettes or have they gone yellow at the end? Heather, would you like to unmute yourself and can't see her? Um, yeah. I I was self pollinating most of them and it's my first time growing courgettes, so some of them didn't work, but I do have one that is that is growing, but they were all self pollinated. Um, okay. So you, yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering if maybe they were coming when you weren't watching them um so no i think the, the one that the one that is growing now probably is the one that i did the best i think <laughs> but we've not seen any bees at all <laughs> so do you grow anything yeah. else that would attract bees at other times of the year well we only started planting more things just recently but we do have and um, the mustard is flowering and um yeah we've got the coriander um, and some wildflowers as well so in theory we do have things that bees would want, but we've just not seen any. And it's probably because we're on fifth floor and we're quite high up. Yeah. And it's quite windy sometimes as well. So I don't know if there's any any advice on how to attract them. I, because they might not obviously come this way ordinarily. Yeah. No, it's maybe not on their path, you know, usually. So how do you kind of attract them to go elsewhere? This is my just comment. Can you. I just comment as a, as a fellow balcony grower? We're on the, not as high as you on the third floor, but we also on the coast, sort of quite a lot of wind. And I used to grow more flowers on the balcony than just now. And I used to get bees. I'm trying to rack my brain for what. So I, I used gonna, to get bees and butterflies quite commonly. So they will come if you um, put yeah, sort of I, nectar sorry. rich stuff in there, I think. I'm showing you some lavender. Um, lavender's got a nice long growing season. Um, where it would provide a reasonable amount of nectar. So if you can get something like a couple of um, pots of lavender and that oregano, bees absolutely love oregano. That's this one here. Um, if you can get that on your balcony so that they get used to coming. So th things like your um, uh, courgettes are going to flower for a day and then fade. But if you've got something that they know they can keep on coming back to, then you're more likely to get the bees mm. to come. I've seen someone set up a plant stall. Um, and at the beginning of the day, there was no bees. But by the end of the day, there was like regular bees coming back and forward. And um, they do just need to find, I think you just need to trap, one, <laughs> get one bee to find you. And then you'll be able to get, hopefully. Just to make it clear, we do advise against trapping, trapping any wildlife to attract. <laughs> <laughs> Exaggeration. <laughs> uh, another comment on a parsnip flower um, from Nari. She uh, says that she's had lots and lots of insects, including aphids, um, um, visiting it and uh, wondering uh, whether because there were parsnips there, maybe the other crops were untouched by aphids. It, it, could, it could be if there's something that this is the like the sacrifice crops that I was talking about. If there's something that the aphids are particularly or any insects particularly keen on, they might go preferentially to the, the one that gives them the best either food or um, safety and food. Um, so that might be that might be why you were um, getting the, the, the uh, yeah, the aphids not coming to anything else. The other thing you can do is by growing the the flowers, like I say, hoverflies, the hoverfly larvae are fantastic at eating the aphids. So if you can be growing flowers that attract hoverflies, which is pretty much most flowers, mm. um, then they'll hopefully be laying their eggs and then the larvae will, will come and, and eat your, your aphids. And that will be giving the hoverfly food for all its, all its stages as well. Parsnip so. flowers would be nice for hoverflies. They like open flowers quite mm, a lot as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I think the last question so far, is, I think we 
Oh yes, that's probably the last question because it's three minutes to go. Any recommended books to read about pollinators? Um, I just recently read, um, no, what was it called again? Dave Gosh, Golson. Just, yeah, the Dave Golson one, Jungle Garden. Garden Jungle, Jungle in your garden or something like that. It's a one, I haven't read it, but the guy is amazing. He knows so much about, well, bumblebees mostly, but actually mm. any kind of insect life um, and pollinator life and how to enhance it. I think he also talks about underground ground critters and like earthworms and all sorts of yeah. stuff in it. Yeah, he does. He mentions the Earthworm Society <laughs> in that book. So, <laughs> so he does, he covers in that, that I think it's called the, yeah, the uh, Garden sorry. Jungle. It covers a, a number of different, um, both pollinators and just other, other things that are, um, living in your garden. He's also got some um, YouTube videos out about pollinators as well. Yeah, so worth uh, checking him out generally. Um, we will link any resources. I think Helen has got some links about wildlife gardening um, into the blog with the video from this um, uh, workshop. So look out for the email. I'm just going to mention as well that we're currently in the middle of the big butterfly count. Um, which is something that the Butterfly Conservation Society run every year. So you take 15 minutes in, in, in any given day and go out and have a look and see what butterflies you can see. And even if you don't see any, that is still a useful piece of information for them. Um, so you can just go and look on the Butterfly Conservation Society, I think it is, or just look up the big butterfly count. Um, and if you want to join in with that, that's a bit of a citizen science thing and they always put a report and tell you um, what this year's um, butterfly count has been and how it's changed from the, the previous years, I think, as well. Okay, um, I think that's us. Um, look out, for, we're gonna send out this email and that's gonna um, point you to the future workshops as well, so you can book yourself in for those. And hopefully there's gonna be a medal making workshop as well. Um, and thanks everyone for coming and thanks Helena for uh, a fabulous presentation. Um, I was wondering if people would like to do a big wave at the end, um, if you can activate your camera and just uh, wave goodbye to everybody, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Bye bye everybody. Bye.